Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the Indian rupee crossed over the U.S. dollar, the USD slash INR cross. Now we're going to be talking about what's happened in India. I'm going to be reading an interesting article from Silver Doctors. But uh, I think it's pretty clear from this chart the direction that the Indian rupee is headed. If you want to look at a con uh, one currency for comparison, we can look at the Argentine peso. And as I pointed out before, technical analysis usually holds with uh, almost all markets uh, when you're talking about parabolic graphs and the reversals, but it doesn't hold with currency markets. And you can see here, we've got a parabolic move and there is no correction. It spikes back up into another parabolic move and then it looks like it's spiking up into another parabolic move. So let's go ahead and cross the Argentine peso over the Indian rupee and you'll see uh, the same sort of pattern here going on. Uh, just since the financial crisis, both of those currencies are absolutely swirling down the drain. Now another currency that is absolutely swirling down the drain is the uh, Venezuelan Bolivar. Now, if you remember, I covered the price on dollar today, and you remember that uh, this madman, fat man, psychopath bus driver Maduro tried to outlaw this site. Of course, it's not hosted there. I think he issued arrest warrants for the host of this. I mean, just an absolute lunatic, that guy. But you can see here, 3,600. When we covered this in the past, many times it was 2,300. So basically, uh, from that 2,300 price, uh, the Venezuelan currency has gone and lost another 50% of its value, basically overnight. Uh, I don't even know what this chart would look like. It's at 3,600 Bolivar to the dollar. So a dollar there is worth an absolute fortune. But let's look at this uh, Silver Doctors article and then we're going to return to Bitcoin and uh, those currencies and the rupee but let's let's read through this here this is from AGXIIK this is a frequent poster on Silver Doctors I guess he's allowed to uh, write his own articles here so it's a good article and then it turns really bad I'll show you here Test Model 1, Cyprus, direct theft of people's capital. Test Model 2, Greece, direct theft of people's capital through bail-ins of megabanks. Test Model 3, India, direct draconian demonetization of the rupee within a four-hour window, thus stealing the savings of 1.1 billion of the poorest people on Earth. Note, there were no warnings. Well, it's time to lay down my marker again. Berwick is a small-minded simpleton. Now, we're going to return to why he said that. Now, for something real to chew on in the war on cash. Test Model 1, Cyprus, direct theft of people's capital, a 40% haircut of all personal, corporate, church, and nonprofit bank accounts, population 1 million, size of theft approximately 23 billion, average cost per citizen $23,000. Test model number two, Greece, direct theft of people's capital through multiple bail-ins of mega banks, theft of pensions, wealth tax on all personal assets, forced disgorgement of wealth of the people, government and national treasures, population 11 million, capital stolen 300 billion, average cost per citizen 27000 Test model number three, India, direct draconian demonetization of the rupee within a four-hour window, thus stealing the savings of 1.1 billion of the poorest people on Earth. India's population, 1.3 billion. Size of the haircut relative to total currency, 45% of $80 billion. Potential losses, $36 billion. And climbing average cost per citizen unknown median net worth of citizens in india is twelve thousand dollars total effect on india's 2.1 trillion dollar gdp is unknown india is the seventh largest gdp in the world third largest in purchasing power parity member of the g20 and founding member of the BRICS. note there were no warnings this action took place within a four hour time period 
late in one evening early in November. This action was taken against the seventh largest GDP in the world, a member of the G20. Let that sink in for a moment. This was a world-shaking salvo against a major economic power with a large military and substantial inventory of nuclear weapons. Notice the size of each country's population. Greek population, 10 times that of Cyprus. Indian population most affected by this demonetization of wealth, 100 times the size of Greece. Greece. Greek losses were five times that of Cyprus. Those numbers are staggering when placed side by side. Indian losses relative to average wealth, value, currency, and Indian GDP are unknown, but likely to equal Greece. These three tests, the last one still in progress, as those responsible for its implementation are still gauging its effectiveness and degree of blowback from the people are proving that these acts of financial war are working beyond anyone's expectation and without a shot being fired. In a tiny three-year time window, 18% of the world's least defended population just got multiple haircuts totaling nearly $1 trillion in losses. These are not trading losses. These are losses levied on we, the people. When you beta test capital thefts, it's best to start small in order to gauge whether there will be widespread violence that results in mass democide. You particularly want to know whether there will be assassinations of government officials and banksters, those directly responsible for these actions, as well as those indirectly involved in planning and implementation of these massive confiscations and expropriations of people's wealth. The five basic pillars of this system must include taking all forms of self-defense, focusing on firearms, reducing availability of cash before and during the confiscation, creating enormous amounts of internationalized debt that's non-dischargeable at personal, corporate, and governmental levels, for an overarching banking and governmental authority that is extra-national, backed by its own self-serving formulations of rule of law, backed by threats of heavy weaponry and armed police forces. Fifth, a dumbed-down population of debt and digit digit fiat supplicants willing to trade their sovereignty and liberty for comfort and slavery. How are these tests working out? Far beyond anyone's expectations. The banksters and government cronies suffered zero casualties. Those involved in these thefts saw their net worth increase exponentially. We now see Citibank in Australia preparing to ban cash at their branches. Sweden and Norway are planning to go cashless. Bill Gates was behind the rupee demonetization to promote the global fintech. Tim Crook, CEO of Crapple, wants a war on cash so his little machines can skim 15 basis points from every transaction. Banning cash prevents bank runs, allows the government to monitor every transaction as well as tax it, facilitating the easy vaporization of digit fiat as at the click of a mouse. The government is in collusion with the banksters to force every person on the planet into the digit fiat debt roach motel. The banksters own the prisons. The governments are little more than a well-paid thugocracy of prison guards. If you are foolish enough to give up your guns, give up your God-given rights and ability to defend yourself, you condemn yourself to becoming nothing more than the banker's bitch in some global fintech super go- superman gulag. Bankers and governments act in their own interests, not yours. Monetarists and tax agents act in their own interests, not yours. If anyone thinks they're safe from the predations of these people, they're operating in a clueless, self-delusional la-la land. 1.1 billion of the poorest people in the world just got a freezing cold water enema from the globalists and banksters. If you think Bitcoin will save the world, you're doubly clueless moron. It did nothing to help the 1.1 billion Indians. Isn't that interesting that he uses this as a shot at Bitcoin? Now, that gives you the reason why he takes the shot there at Jeff Berwick. Jeff Berwick, like myself, has been an early adopter of Bitcoin, an early proponent of Bitcoin. And uh, so overall, a very good article, but uh, totally wrong when it comes to Bitcoin. In fact, I think when we dig deeper into this, we're going to see that Bitcoin may actually be uh, behind this whole thing. 
uh, it may be their panic at uh, not being able to stop it that they have to do something really fast before it spins out of control. But the first thing I want to show you on this is from Fiat Leak. And uh, this is money flowing into Bitcoin. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that here on Fiat Leak, well, since I, I opened this up a while ago and let it run just to see what would accumulate. But you can see, first of all, I want you to notice there is no INR listed here at all. So I'm assuming that, you know, that they were aware of that. It's just that the number of rupees that flow into Bitcoin is such a small number. And the significance of the Indians, Indian exchanges is so small. And I've looked other places and haven't really really been able to find the significance that they, they're not even listed but you can see the main countries and of course the absolutely dominant one here you can see we've had a total of 2332 bitcoins flow into currency since i started this window and 2300 of it is in china uh, you've got 62 bitcoins worth in the u.s you've got 0.1 in euros and you've got negligible in uh, Russia, you've got some in, in South Africa, 2.7 Bitcoin. So what's going on? Well, I would argue that this is actually a, a graph, a graphic, we'll say, of the most intelligent and aware people in the world. And it, it's clear that the number one is the Chinese and number two is the U.S. and barely in third place is the Europeans and the Russians because it's coming it's coming for everyone he is right about that but he's absolutely wrong about bitcoin's ability to protect people from this because bitcoin does have that ability and i think the ability of bitcoin to protect people from this is why the indian government moved when it moved and you can see that in this article bitcoin price reaches 995 dollars in india after government rendered most currency useless now if we go up here to the bitcoin wisdom chart you can see that the huobi is quoting us a price of 750 dollars per bitcoin so that's a substantial uh, premium for bitcoin in india let's read this article prices have skyrocketed at indian bitcoin exchange platforms following the government's decision to denominate the 500 and 1000 rupee currency notes to den I guess it should say re-denominate, with only a night's notice. On November 8th, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi shocked all his countrymen when he announced the government's decision to make all 500 and 1,000 rupee currency notes useless starting the next day. The government officially said that terrorist groups and money laundering groups were stockpiling currency notes in an attempt to avoid paying taxes and hiding illicit funds. So there you go. You've got a bankrupt government. That's right here. Uh, it, all you got to do is look at the currency. Uh, we saw that with the Venezuelan Bolivar. We see that with the Argentine Peso. Same pattern. We've got a big, huge pennant forming here. We know where that's going. That's the Indian rupee going down the tube. But uh, the government is going to tell us that the reason why they're doing this is because of the evil terrorists and money launderers. Uh, no, that's not why they're doing it. They're doing it because the government is profligate, they're irresponsible, and they've wasted the money, and they're deep in debt, and they're going to go bankrupt. And they're going to steal as much of the people's money as they possibly can before that happens. By denominating the 500 and 1,000 rupee currency notes, which accounted for roughly 90% of all Indian money, the government hoped to render this cash stockpile useless or at least trick crooks to go to a bank and exchange their notes, effectively declaring all their funds. While a smart idea in hindsight, the decision backfired after a few days as Indians were left with no means of paying for food or utilities. Without money in their pockets and limited to small daily ATM withdrawals, Indians turned to mobile wallets but also to Bitcoin. 
As demand for Bitcoin grew, the market at Indian-based Bitcoin to Rupee exchange platforms went through the roof as prices currently reached a 35% premium. While one U.S. Bitcoin is valued at $735 or 50,000 rupees at almost all Bitcoin exchanges over the world, this is not true in India. If you wanted to buy one Bitcoin in India and you wanted to do it with rupees, it would cost well above that. For example, Bitcoin to Rupee Service Unicoin is currently selling one Bitcoin for 62,000 rupees, which is $909 after previously Today, the price reached a whopping $985. Fellow service said pay is at 61,828 rupees per Bitcoin, which is $901. During the weekend, the Bitcoin rupee exchange rate at Zeb pay reached a staggering value of $996 per Bitcoin. Similarly, at Bitcoin India, the price is 65,000 rupees or $960. While at CoinSecure.in, the buy price peaked today at $61,969 or $903. The reason for this 35% premium is due to problems in accessing liquidity at Indian banks. The only currency with higher Bitcoin premium is the Ni Nigerian ne Nehru, uh, I'm sorry, Naira, going for around $1,250 per Bitcoin, meaning a premium of 70%. Indian government already introduced new 502,000 rupee notes, but their limited withdrawals at 4,000 rupees, $60 per day. In the meantime, Indians are overpaying for Bitcoin in the process of finding alternative means of payment until the currency crisis ends. So there you go. Uh, exactly the opposite. Uh, now, if you think about this, $995 per Bitcoin is the price that's being quoted in India and uh, it's not that hard to exchange rupees. They're not, it's not a hyperinflationary currency at this point. I've shown you, you know, the move in the rupee is uh, from the financial crisis of 40 to 1 to 68 to 1. So that's nothing like a hyperinflation. But you can see the premium on Bitcoin in India. Now, that means that if you converted that Bitcoin uh, back into dollars, then you would actually be making a 35% profit off of this crisis. You could convert it into dollars and then back into rupees again. Uh, that's assuming that you were already holding Bitcoin. Now, what's interesting here is, again, back to the fiat leak, uh, nobody is. So for this character to say that Bitcoin didn't protect India, the only reason why Bitcoin didn't protect India the Indians is because the Indians are staggeringly ignorant of Bitcoin and its potential. You can bet that the window is closing very, very quickly now on the Chinese government for doing something like that because we would see a Bitcoin price absolutely through the roof because the 95% of Bitcoin trading now is going on in China. And I don't think the government could get away with it there. I think there's too much knowledge of Bitcoin in China. There's probably too much knowledge of Bitcoin in the United States. It looks like they're striking at the weak ones, uh, the ones that are ignorant of Bitcoin. Uh, and another reason, another big reason to go cashless is that one of the ways they can't stop fiat leaking into Bitcoin is through cash transactions. So, for example, we know that Coinbase is under investigation by the IRS. They want their records. Obviously, the IRS wants to be able to tax capital gains that occurred in Bitcoin. So they want to get all the records from Coinbase and everybody who bought Bitcoins from Coinbase. And uh, so that's happening here. Uh, but uh, um, in India... There's just not that opportunity because there just aren't that many uh, who are I even involved. So they're trying to get the cash out of the system. Uh, and if you look at Coinbase or any of these other exchanges, these are linked bank accounts that you have to, it depends on the exchange, but you have to do some type of verification. There's dollar transfer limits. So, uh, when people don't have the ability to use those exchanges, they can use things like local Bitcoins, which is sort of a meetup type thing, which obviously, if you know about Bitcoin, 
it's not very difficult now when you have these mobile wallets. Basically, two people with a cell phone can go and meet in any location, and one can hand the other one cash, and the other one can transfer the appropriate amount of Bitcoin from the online wallet, and they can see the transaction occur. They can literally hand the cash over and transfer the Bitcoin at the same time. So the ability to buy Bitcoins with cash is a big chink in their armor. Uh, they can always come in and shut down Coinbase. They can shut down Bitcoin India. They can shut down all the exchanges where people transfer digital dollars into digital cryptocurrencies. But they can't shut down uh, transfers of cash into cryptocurrencies unless they just completely outright ban cash transactions. And so I think that this may actually be hinting at that, this Indian crisis. It seems that they're striking at the weakest players, and uh, now that's India. It's going to be interesting going forward if they're going to try to strike at the stronger players. I think the next one is going to be either the U.S. or China. And we'll talk to you next time.